Thanks for joining us today on The Sword and Trial. Today, Graham and I get to have a conversation with Brandon Ray. Brandon is an author of a new forthcoming book from Founders Press called Spurgeon's Forgotten Sabbatarianism. Everybody loves Spurgeon, but not everybody knows all of the convictions that Spurgeon held, and certainly that is true with regard to his view of the Lord's Day. So listen in, and if you find this helpful, please pass it on to others as well. Welcome to The Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries, and Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. Delighted to have you join us today, and we want to extend a special appreciation to our Founders Alliance members and churches that support us and enable us to produce this podcast and all the other materials that we try to supply the church through Founders Ministries. Today, we're delighted to have with us, joining us remotely, uh, Brandon Ray, who is a pastor in Missouri and has a book forthcoming from Founders Press on Charles Spurgeon's Forgotten Sabbatarianism. So, Brandon, welcome to The Sword and Trowel. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So tell us uh, where you are in Missouri, and uh, you're a pastor there, so tell us a little bit about that as well. I'm in Kirksville, Missouri, which is in northeastern Missouri. It's three hours from St. Louis, Kansas City, and Des Moines. It's a college town with Truman State University and is the hub of a rural area. I came here about seven and a half years ago to a a small church uh, and a revitalization effort. Um, We had about 22 average attendants, and my wife was the youngest uh, person in the congregation. And uh, we just uh, preached the word and loved on the people. And by God's grace, uh, he's brought in families. Uh, It's completely against what a lot of people would would see as the the means. Uh, But God gets the glory in that. And just people who hunger and thirst for the word of God and and hold to our doctrine. And, and, and so through that, um, the church has grown. And, and during that time, I've been able to also be close enough to go to Midwestern and to do this project on uh, my dissertation, which is now this book. Very good. So uh, tell us, how, how did you get involved with uh, studying a subject like Spurgeon and his Sabbatarian views? So for a while, I've been thinking about the differences between the Old and New Testament. It came up when I was at seminary. I had a professor who said nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. So the, the one that wasn't was the Fourth Commandment, so we don't have an obligation to keep the Sabbath Commandment. And that mm. just never uh, settled with me, and so I wanted to learn more. And, and through the process, I, I became more uh, covenantal in theology. And then uh, for five years, I was a member of a uh, Kurt Daniels Church in Springfield, Illinois, and uh, and learned a lot from him, and even learned to listen to his series on the Ten Commandments, and seeing the influence uh, uh, that academia had on him, and, and just being able to preach, I wanted to go on and, and do uh, my own studies, and so I was thinking of doing Charles Spurgeon and evangelism, open air preaching. And uh, when I got to Midwestern, I met a brother named Ed Romine, and he already wanted to do that too. And thought, well, is there another subject? And and uh, and in reading Spurgeon, this just keep coming up. Uh, he would list sins like uh, lying, uh, stealing, uh, uh, cursing, and then he'd throw in Sabbath breaking, and that just struck me because I never heard anyone preach like that before. And so. Uh, the more I dug in, the more I saw that it is uh, throughout all his literature and, and his sermons, and uh, no one had touched it. And so it, it was an opportunity for me to uh, scratch that itch for wanting to learn more about how to understand the Old and New Testament and also to uh, dig into Spurgeon uh, as a mentor and also to reveal to people that he actually held to this view. It's fascinating. It is, it is amazing. The more you read Spurgeon, the more you realize his views were Outside the pale of uh, modern evangelicalism. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves Spurgeon until they read him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's fascinating. You mentioned two, two friends uh, that we have here, Ed and Kurt. Uh, what a privilege to be able to uh, sit under Kurt's ministry for that length of time. Uh, God certainly gifted him, and he's uh, written and taught on these subjects quite a while. And I'm, I'm fascinated with how uh, you came into this via Spurgeon and your own kind of desire to understand relationship of Old Covenant, New Covenant, and the Ten Commandments. What do you say now, having done that kind of study 
over the last several years. What do you say now to the person who says, well, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, so we're obligated to keep nine, but not the fourth? I think first you go to Hebrews 4. Um, if you take John Owen's view there, that a uh, Sabbath day remains for the people of God, that that whole premise that only nine of the ten are there is is um, doesn't hold up to that reading of the text. Uh, secondly, you just see how it's embedded throughout Scripture, and going back to, of course, Genesis 2, and then the whole basis uh, for saying God created everything in six days is the basis for the Sabbath and Exodus 20. And you see this continuity that in God's character and that it continues to move forward. Of course, part of this is dealing with the tripartite view of the law, mm. that it's divided into the more moral, ceremonial, and judicial, and that uh, if God tells us how to worship him, then he also tells us when to worship him as a gathered people. And uh, that is for all people of all time. And because of the resurrection of Christ, now we do it on Sunday uh, to recognize that we are in Christ, that we have the victory in Christ, and uh, because of that, we have hope. And that uh, division of the law, the three-part division of the law, that's something Spurgeon held to as well, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. Uh, He he talks about all the time uh, throughout his uh, writings, especially the moral part of the law and talking about the Ten Commandments, that they are engraved on stone, that they... uh, do not, uh, are not abolished, that there's a standard for all time that God has given, and that uh, we should joyfully, and this is what I want to pick up on, it, it's not a burden to keep the Sabbath for the Christian. It is a joy mm. that God has told us to stop your normal labors, to labor for the Lord on Sunday, and don't feel guilty about it. So gather with the people of God, worship Him, and not just outwardly, but inwardly. Go out and do evangelism. Uh, visit those who are downcast uh, in the home. Disciple your children and teach them the Word of God, as Spurgeon's mom did when he was young. And so that this should be not a, a day of inactivity, that, that wasn't Spurgeon's view, but a day where we can put our hands to the plow and really uh, just focus on what God has us to do without any distraction. Yeah, this is an area uh, of tremendous neglect in our day among modern evangelicals and even those that uh, are part of the Calvinistic resurgence over the last 30 years or so. Uh, The idea that there is a day that is set apart, that's to be kept differently, holy as to the Lord, uh, seems pharisaical, legalistic. I mean, you can be called everything in the book, and I've certainly heard that argument as well, that only nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, and yet I think when Jesus said you know, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man mm-hmm. for the Sabbath, he didn't say the Sabbath was made for Jews, mm-hmm. but for man, for creatures, and that certainly is what Exodus does in uh, its recitation of those Ten Commandments, taking it back to creation. And to see this as a creation ordinance and, and the way you described it, that you know, that Isaiah 58, call the Sabbath a delight. Mm-hmm. This is something God designed for us. We need this. We can uh, utilize this in such a way that it helps us uh, in every area of life. I mean, how many times have I used the argument and I've heard the argument from other people that uh, I just don't have time. I don't have time <laughs> to read the Bible. I don't have time to read good books. I have t- God's given us a day. Mm. A whole day that if yeah. we would take seriously that argument would suddenly be uh, completely deflated. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation on the sword and the trial. I wanted to remind you and bring to your attention a new title by Founders Press titled Spurgeon's Forgotten Sabbatarian by Brandon Rea. This is a wonderful book on the law of God and Spurgeon's views of the Christian Sabbath. It's kind of a controversial topic in our day, even amongst many Reformed Baptists, but I think that we can learn a lot from the wisdom of Spurgeon. Uh, this is on presale right now at founders.org. You can uh, order this for a discount and orders will show ship uh, in February of 2024. It's interesting that, you know, the, the entire law, it's holy, it's righteous, it's good. The, all of the law is a blessing. But ironically, and I think arguably, the fourth commandment is the m- most self-evidently a blessing to mm-hmm. us. Uh, it's a day of rest set aside our labors to rest and worship the Lord. But it also, um, at least in modern evangelicalism, is the one law that we kind of want to 
weasel out of, <laughs> you know, of all the laws that are maybe even less uh, self-evidently blessings to us. We want to get out of the fourth commandment. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that the Puritan reformed, um, the way that they explained the law has been so helpful for me in that, yeah, certainly they hold to that um, threefold distinction of the law uh, in the Old Testament, but then they also have this kind of twofold distinction between uh, moral law and positive law. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you can see civil law and ceremonial law falling under that category of positive law. And positive law is just given uh, as covenantal law. It's law given for a particular covenant and people who are part of that covenant. And when, if you're not a part of that covenant with Yahweh, well, then that law is not binding upon you. That's what positive law is. And, um, you know, the, the Puritans, the reformed saw the 10 commandments. That's, that's not necessarily covenantal law, but rather it's moral law. It's eternal. It's transcendent. It's, it's binding upon all people, regardless of what covenant you find yourself in. Um, and if we see the 10 commandments as being written by the very finger of God and coming from God and on tablets of stone, um, if we see that as the moral law, well then the whole argument, well, we see these nine repeated in the new Testament, but we don't see the fourth repeated in the new Testament. So it's not binding. Well, that doesn't hold any water because it's, it's moral law. It's binding upon all people everywhere at all times. Yeah. Brandon, did, uh, did you pick up on Spurgeon uh, using those two categories of moral and positive law in addition to the threefold division? He doesn't use the category positive, but in his hermeneutics, that's how he does it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Andrew Fuller, he does. Mm-hmm. He makes that distinction between moral and positive. Spurgeon ca- carries that on, but he doesn't use the term positive. So he's, he looks at the ceremonial law and how they point to Christ and how uh, the, the there were shadows and signs and how the mercy seat with the law of God underneath of it and Christ is satisfying that through his uh, atonement on the cross and the shedding of his blood. Uh, he uses that uh, consistently, but not using that positive distinction term. Yeah, you know, one way that I've tried to uh, teach this over the years is distinguishing distinguishing between uh, a law that is commanded because it's right, which is moral, Mm -hmm. and a law Mm -hmm. that is right because it's commanded, which Mm -hmm. is positive. And sometimes I think people are confused because they they just assume that all law is positive. It's all imposed almost arbitrarily, you know, might makes right. and Voluntarism. Yeah, that's right, the whole idea. And yet, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the moral commandments that we have given to us in Scripture, they're a transcript of God's character. Mm-hmm. These are not arbitrary. You know, th- these are are commanded to us because they are right. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's something transcendent about them because they come to us from the very transcendent God who in his revelation to his creatures bearing his image has instructed us to represent him in this world. Yeah, they're they're <clears throat> eternal and they're transcendent because God is eternal and transcendent. And if even if there were no creatures there to obey those laws, those laws would still be present because God is still present. That's right. And so the the ceremonial law, the civil law, the of the Old Testament uh, Israel and uh, what we would call positive law. Those things were given by God for certain purposes, certain seasons. And so you're not in sin if you don't practice circumcision today, because mm-hmm. we're not under that old Jewish covenant and nor uh, were Abraham and his children in sin because he didn't baptize uh, his himself or mm-hmm. have himself baptized because that was not a positive command mm-hmm. for that era. So this even thinking about the law in this kind of careful way, that's something that needs to be recovered in mm-hmm. our day. One of the things that Founders has done by God's grace from the beginning in our confessional commitments to the 1689 has tried to emphasize the law and the gospel and to show their distinction and their mutual support of one another, the necessity of not confusing them. And I think it was probably seven or eight years ago, uh, we determined to double down on that, that that was going to be one of our three main emphases going forward. And uh, I'm grateful that the Lord has led us that way, because if you get the law and the gospel straight If you can understand the distinctions and what you're talking about and how to understand both law and gospel, you're not going to go far afield in many of the important areas that Mm -hmm. we're called upon to believe and to to live in the light of. So, Brandon, tell us about, you know, your own, I mean, were you raised to think this way about God's law? 
Now, I grew up in a, an American Baptist church, so formerly the Northern Baptist, and it was a church that was, uh, uh, wasn't as liberal as the American Baptists were, but uh, certainly uh, wasn't complementarian. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the process of going to seminary, I was faced with these questions I never knew existed, came up with, oh, there's a systematic theology textbook. Where has this been all my life? I can't believe this. <laughs> and digging in, and then you start to learn more and more, and then uh, coming in contact with the Second London Confession and seeing all the different categories there. And that's why in this book of mine, I wanted to show that Spurgeon, when he republished the Second London in 1855, to show that he actually adhered to what, what people would take as a normal uh, uh, first and uh, in, in changing it because they don't adhere to the Sabbath principle. A lot, there are a lot of people who say, I, I hold to the Second London except for the Sabbath or, mm-hmm. or the Pope or a couple other things. But, but no, Spurgeon actually held to chapter 19 uh, on the law of God. He held to chapter 22, paragraph 7 and 8, that there is a Christian Sabbath that goes on and on. And, uh, and so it was through that reading and discovery that I really settled on this and, and seeing also that it's, it's supposed to be about joy, as, as we alluded to earlier. I just want to read a quote where Spurgeon compared the joy of marriage to the joy of the Sabbath day. Mm. He says, marriage and the Sabbath are the two choice boons of primeval love that have come down to us from paradise the one to bless the outer and the other our inner life. And, and, and I think unfortunately, even those who are wanting to uh, recover uh, some who want to recover Sabbath keeping, we can come at it from a a harsh way instead of this is freeing. Mm -hmm. This is joy. We get to focus on Christ. We get to gather with God's people. We get to serve him. We get to set aside our labors and that should stir our hearts because Really, every Sabbath, what we're doing is we are having an appetizer to heaven. Mm-hmm. Uh, George Herbert was a, a, poem, a poet, an Anglican poet there in the 17th century, and, and Spurgeon loved to read him. He has a poem called Sunday, and the last stanza, I think, is, is appropriate. Let me just read that to you. He says, Thou art a day of mirth, and where the weekdays trail on ground, Thy flight is higher as they birth. Oh, let me take thee at the bound, leaping with thee from seven to seven, till that we both, being tossed from earth, fly hand in hand to heaven. And and the idea is that we are skipping every Sabbath day on this journey to the eternal Sabbath, which is beholding the face of God forever and ever. Mm. And so if we have that view of a Sabbath day, that is glorious instead of a burden. Yeah. I often think of, and I've talked to some of our congregants about the Sabbath day as being just another stepping stone on our way to glory. And each Sabbath is bringing us closer and closer. uh, And it's another reminder. And I think if I had uh, any criticism, even for the, um, the London Baptist confession, it would be in the chapter on um, religious worship in the Sabbath day in that, you know, I don't disagree with anything that it says, but I think by omission, it kind of leaves out some of what you're just Mm -hmm. talking about. I mean, there's nothing in there about feasting. There's nothing in there about rejoicing. And I wish that that had been present in it. Now I get in their historical context, they're trying to fight against some of the games that were being played and all that bear baiting and and drinking games (laughs) that were happening in England at the time. Uh, But even so, I think we can see the Sabbath day as drudgery when it's, oh man, it's a lot of work. Oh, you know, I got to get my kids to church. Oh, you know, now we got to go back for the afternoon service. Oh no, you know, but it's, it should be a day of feasting and rejoicing. Yeah. I think too, some people look at uh, the old Testament uh, prohibitions of attending the Sabbath. And then some of the uh, later uh, additions to that and they think, oh, my goodness, why? I mean, I even heard one prominent Southern Baptist leader uh, from a previous generation say, why, uh, if we were to adopt this view that you're advocating, it would be a sin for me to start my car on Sunday because of the combustible engine, you know, inside. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just this, this complete misunderstanding. We're not talking about a Jewish Sabbath. 
at all. We are in the new covenant. We're not Jews. And so we enjoy the Sabbath and we celebrate the Sabbath. We observe the Sabbath as new covenant believers. We're not under all the niggling prohibitions and prescriptions that we find in that old covenant era. We're just a couple of days away from our National Founders Conference down here in Southwest Florida, and the conference this year is Remember Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't had an opportunity to get tickets and you aren't able to travel down here to sunny Southwest Florida to join us, fret not. You can still access the conference. If you go to founders.org, we will be live streaming the entire conference for free. We'd much rather have you here with us so we can see your beautiful faces, but if you can't be here, you can live stream the entire conference. Just go to founders.org. I remember reading a story once about Spurgeon and how uh, someone criticized him because he uh, took his, uh, I think it was horse-drawn or Mm mule-drawn carriage to church on Sunday. He said, well, you're causing your beasts of burden to break the Sabbath. (laughs) And he said, oh, no, I'm not. They're Jewish. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's a favorite story there. Yeah, Uh, But he did, Spurgeon, uh, he did hold to the distinction of works of necessity, mercy, and piety. Mm. Uh, if you look at his commentary on Matthew and Matthew 12. Mm. Uh, so if we have those categories, then we can say, is this necessary? Is it, is this, uh, is this helping someone else in mercy like Jesus healed on the Sabbath? Uh, is this part of piety or is this something that is getting in the way of what God has designed? And so really it's not just the dotting the I's and crossing the T's, but what is my heart? Right. Do, yeah. do I really want to worship God today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think Matthew 12 is so important for a proper understanding, not just of uh, the Sabbath command, but the, the law <laughs> in general. I mean, I think Christ makes it clear there as he, you know, he heals the man with the withered hand. His disciples are eating the grain from the field. He, he basically mm-hmm. is making the point that the law is given for life. Mm-hmm. And when you are pursuing life, you are not transgressing the law. When you heal the man with the withered hand, you're not transgressing the law. When you pull your sheep out of the pit, you're not transgressing the law. When you prepare food for yourself and for your family, you're not transgressing the law. Um, and it's helpful for us in understanding because a lot of Sabbatarians, I think, fall into the same trap that the Pharisees fell into in trying to um, put such strict uh, guidelines and laws around Sabbath keeping uh, that we end up creating new laws that God has Mm -hmm. not commanded. And Jesus says, you know, the, the, the the Sabbath is created for man and and the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And um, it's, it's meant to be a blessing, not, not meant to be um, constricting. Amen. Yeah. I, I, (laughs) I had lunch one time with a leader in uh, the New Covenant Theology movement, and we were discussing uh, the Sabbath, and he he finally said, well, Thompson, if you just give me a list, give me a list of what I've got to do and what I can't do to keep (laughs) the fourth commandment, you know, then I I, I might be able to to go down the road with you some. And I said to him, look, I'll give you a list on the fourth commandment when you give me a list on the 10th commandment. (laughs) And uh, so, you know, the, the point you're making there, it's internal. It is the attitude of the heart. And people do, sometimes very conscientiously, as they begin to understand, oh, wait a minute, God cares about my time. The fourth commandment exists, and I'm obligated. So can I go out to eat? Can I get gas in my car? Can I go throw the football with my son? I mean, those are real questions, and we've mm-hmm. just resisted. we said, look, we're not giving you a list here. We mm-hmm. want to first get to the, the fundamental point that God owns time. He created it. He created this day for you, and so you have, need to have a disposition to honor him in it. And then look at those uh, exceptional categories of necessity and piety and mercy. And there sometimes it might be merciful for you to take your wife out to eat mm-hmm. on a Sunday. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw stones at a person who does that, uh, who real- realizes, okay, this is a, an exceptional kind of situation. Certainly, we're grateful that policemen and firemen and doctors and nurses uh, don't say, oh, no, no, you know, we're not going to work on the Sabbath. Sorry, you're going to have to wait and get over your heart attack on Monday. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are just common sense. God created this world and God created us to live in his world and to flourish in his world by uh, submitting ourselves to the provisions he's made for us in the gospel and ordering our lives to the uh, guidance he gives us in his commandments. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we will live well. Yeah, I'm interested, Brandon, um, and maybe this comes out in the book and maybe it doesn't. A, A lot of people who are hesitant with applying the fourth commandment to us today um, 
say, you know, in the, in the 10 commandments, it was given as the, the, the Sabbath day was given on the, the last day of the week. But today we celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week. Even in the London Baptist confession, it says that it is a command. It is a positive moral command. And so it is, um, it's moral in that it's eternal and transcendent, but it also has a positive dimension in that it has been in the old covenant. It was celebrated on the first day in the, or on the last day in the, in the new covenant, it's celebrated on the first day. Did, um, does Spurgeon get into, does he give any arguments as to why biblically speaking that day would be transferred? Yes, he does. And of course he lays heavy emphasis on the resurrection of Christ as the central reason, because when we are gathering, we are uh, professing in our gathering that we believe Christ was raised from the dead on the first day. And because of that, we have hope, we have life, we have everlasting life. He points to the fact, as you were saying, that, yes, there is the moral element of the law of the fourth commandment that we are to set aside one day in every seven. But the positive aspect is what day should it be observed. And with the testimony of the New Testament churches when they uh, gathered on the first day of the week, and then especially with, like I said, Christ being raised, uh, th- that that is why we worship and why that day has been changed, because the new covenant has been instituted and we are identifying with the risen Lord on his day. Mm. Very good. Well, we're grateful that you have written this book, and we look forward to getting it out and available. Uh, it's on. Uh, it's available now on pre-order, so you can go to founders.org and uh, get your name on a list so that you'll get one of the very first copies and also get it at a good discount on a pre-order special. And if you'd like to know more about just the law and the gospel, uh, we've published a book by Ernie Reisinger that is entitled by that as well, The Law and the Gospel. It's a wonderful primer for this whole area. And we just encourage folks, uh, look forward to this book that's coming out by Brandon. If you love Spurgeon, if you've learned from Spurgeon, then you ought to at least consider what Spurgeon understood about the commandments of God and specifically the fourth commandment. We have friends that disagree with us on this and we're not trying to uh, start any wars, but we do want to sharpen one another, to challenge one another, to think as critically and biblically as we can about all of life, given what the Lord has revealed to us in his word. Brandon, uh, your book will help in that uh, pursuit and we're grateful to you. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Sword and Trial. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for the opportunity to to be able to talk more about Spurgeon and have this book published for the church. Thank you for being with us today. If this podcast has been helpful to you, would you mind sharing it with others and letting them know about this important conversation and this important book that will be released soon by Founders Press?